A good friend of uh, Jeanette of mine is a man called Bryn Jones in England, uh, who is now living in the States, down in St. Louis. And <clears throat> Bryn's wife, Edna, uh, they now have four children. But uh, there was a time when they didn't have any children. And they were... Uh, Bryn wasn't so concerned as Edna was. Edna was very concerned because she'd had prophetic words over her that God was going to give her a son. And uh, that was not happening. I, I forget how many years they were married, but they, she just was not conceiving. And uh, she was very troubled about it. And uh, so Bryn finally said to Edna to go and, and spend some time with the Lord. Just uh, mark off a day and make that day a special day of just seeking the Lord to find out what God is saying in this. And uh, she was several hours in her bedroom and uh, when she came out, uh, Bryn could see that, that she'd obviously been crying and but she was also, her face was radiant. And uh, so Bryn said, you've heard from the Lord. She said, yes, I have. And this was the word that the Lord gave to her out of Matthew 11. Uh, it's where John the Baptist is in prison. And uh, he is wondering. And at verse 2, Now when John in prison heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or shall we look for someone else? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and report to John the things which you hear and see. We've just been singing about this. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. Blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me or takes no offense in me. Now that word is the is a Greek word scandalon and it means much more than uh, it's where we get the word scandalized from. It means much more than just what may seem here to be offended you know our wives can get offended but it may it may last for five minutes or it may last for a week those of you unmarried just beware <laughs> uh, husbands can be offended uh, as well but we get over that hopefully they're little offenses, but this is not what is meant here. This is a strong word here. It means to end up in a permanent state of being offended. Now, Edna, after she got that word from the Lord, she embraced it. She said, all right, Lord, I will not be offended in you. Even though there have been prophetic words, my confidence is in you. If you want to change your mind, that's up to you. And God does change his mind. Scripture says so. Um, <clears throat> but she said, I'm, you are bigger to me than having a baby. And when she got through on that, I think it was the week after, she conceived and began the first of four children. God does that to us sometimes. God wants to know that he is bigger to us than anything we have or any other relationship that we have. And he will test it down the line until he knows he has our hearts. That's why it says, Now God did tempt Abraham. Take Isaac, your son, whom you love. I and mean, it's as if God really loaded it uh, heavy. I know you love him, now you take him and sacrifice him. And it must have broken Abraham's heart to take his son uh, to that mountain to offer him. We'll never understand the pain for hour after hour and those number of days that they traveled to go that distance. But Abraham did not turn back. And it was in the very act of sacrificing his son that God says, Stop. Now I know. 
what's really in your heart. Now I believe God knew what was in Abraham's heart, but Abraham needed to know what was in his heart and his relationship with God. And that's so important. And so God will touch anything that stands in the way. And uh, for, for Edna, that was a child. A child was bigger than Jesus. And once Jesus was clear in her vision, in her desire, then she could have the child. Jesus said, no, except um, uh, if you hate not, for that means put me before your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your wife, children, yes, and even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. He demands to be first. Let's go back to this word, stumbling. I want to say several things this morning um, about this. Uh, I'd like you to turn to Proverbs 18. And the first thing I want to say is this. It is very difficult to win back someone who is scandalized. If there's one thing I want to impart to you by God the Holy Spirit this morning, is that this matter of being scandalized is a very serious, destructive element. If we find ourselves in this state, it will destroy us. It will destroy me as a person if I'm the one who has it, but it will be destructive to those that are around us. And when a person is in this state, it is very, very difficult to win them back. It says in Proverbs 18 verse 19, a brother offended, scandalized, is harder to be won than a strong city. Now we're giving, this is what the scriptures teach. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. Now I'm, I'm almost an expert in knowing how true this is. Because when, when someone is offended, someone has heard something and they, they, they latch on to something that you're teaching or preaching and they're offended by it. Every move you make is questioned. The motives are questioned. They can't really hear your heart. And you can be hurting yourself. I, I send a, 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 a tape, a letter, uh, I was taping a letter yesterday evening to a brother um, in New Zealand, and uh, just uh, sharing with him uh, my, my love for him and the pain he has been going through. He is of a prophetic uh, um, ministry and nature. And so he comes over very strong. I mean, if you want to uh, find out what some prophets are like, John the Baptist is an example. <laughs> you know, uh, you whited sepulchres, this is to the Pharisees, uh, and so on. I mean, how to win friends and influence people, prophets often miss. <laughs> no one ever introduced them to the book. Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, uh, the strong words, Nathan the prophet, David uh, is, is come back from that awful sin, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the prophet speaks to him direct and so when that little parable that he told David, and David says, show me the man that I deal with him. And, and Nathan says, thou art the man. I mean, it's whew, straight in. And I shared uh, with him because I know in his heart this man cares. He really cares. And he, he is in pain because... He is not understood. And that's one of the problems a prophet has to walk through is that people do not understand or receive that prophetic ministry. And when someone is offended from that, they are very difficult to be won. The second thing I'd like to say is <clears throat> that stumbling box or uh, stones of offense Stones of scandalizing, if you turn to Matthew 18, please, are inevitable. 
I want to say categorically this morning that every person here present <clears throat> will experience occasions for stumbling. You have a choice. But you will be uh, uh, confronted with a situation that will invite you to be offended. Everyone here, and I want to say furthermore, it won't happen once. It'll happen quite a number of times in your life. But you do have a choice. Matthew 18 and verse 7, it says, uh, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. <clears throat> now, thirdly, I want to share concerning root causes of most offenses, or the root cause, rather. Right at the heart, of being scandalized is this false expectations false expectations Cain expected his offering to be received but it wasn't and he was scandalized and he slew his brother Sarah expected a baby and when she didn't she encouraged her husband to commit adultery. Esau expected his birthright blessing. And when he was denied it, his heart was filled with hate and he wanted to kill his brother, who already by now had taken off because he knew what was going to happen. Hannah expected a baby and it says she wept bitterly. There was bitterness in Hannah's uh, heart. Naaman expected the prophet Elisha to come out personally. Remember Naaman had leprosy and uh, his, his, uh, his wife's maid had told her about the prophet in Israel and so Naaman sets off and he's got all his entourage with him and he comes uh, uh, to the front door and probably sent his servant to knock on the door. <laughs> Wouldn't get down off of his horse. I'm Naaman the captain. And so the prophet's inside. He sends his servant out and says, tell Naaman to go and wash in Jordan. He could have said, dirty, muddy, filthy Jordan. <laughs> but he didn't. Naaman already knew what Jordan was like. It was like a muddy puddle. Didn't bless him at all. And Naaman uh, said, I thought he would call on the name of the Lord and wave his hand over the place. See, that was what his expectation was. He didn't like what he heard. Go and wash in Jordan seven times. And he begins to turn his horse and his chariot around to return back to his land. And his servant said to him, if the prophet had asked you to, to wash in the two great rivers in our nation, would you have done it? And they encouraged him, they enticed him to do what the prophet said. And of course, when he did, uh, he was wonderfully healed. But the first, the response, the initial response of Naaman was one of rejection. Jonah expected God to destroy Nineveh to fulfill his prophecy. He prophesied, Nineveh, finished. Your sin has come up before God, you're getting the axe. But they all repented. And that really upset Jonah when God said, oh, well, in that case, I'll spare you. <laughs> And he sat down and he wanted to die. He really wanted to die. He, uh, he had suicidal tendencies. But now, that's funny, but you know, that's what happens out of being scandalized. A person who is scandalized 
It's an area of the enemy who comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and he will put self-pitying thoughts, he will put thoughts, give you thoughts, of, uh, of, of committing suicide. I'm going to share with you six sources of being scandalized. first one is personal possession. Um, I think of, uh, I'm not necessarily thinking of money now or furniture, but you could include that, but I'm thinking like someone who possesses the piano. I've played this piano for 40 years and I'm going to go on playing it until I die. Now, that, that may be foreign to some of you here, but I can think of at least two organists in churches that uh, I have been in in my life as a, as a, a, a committed member, where, uh, the, in fact, one was where she played the piano. And I tell you, she was deeply offended uh, when it was suggested that she might give somebody else a try now and again. I mean, that was a big risk to start with. You could hardly approach the situation, but the fact was she was far gone beyond the place where she was playing the piano either for the glory of God or for the blessing of God's people. We were all trapped into her playing, which was very, very limited. <laughs> now, I'm being serious. But such was the, the, uh, the strength of this dear soul. I think she was about 80 at the time was she did. We won't mention them. She's with the Lord now. <laughs> so she's no longer... And the music has improved considerably. The last time I was back there, not bathing stove, the, miserable, the, the music... <laughs> miserable music had uh, become more joyful but it was heavy going custody of the children see this is where the rubber meets the road for some of us here I remember my brother uh, who had a divorce and uh, many years ago and the pain that he went through when the custody of the children and his wife, the, uh, it was on the issue of her committing adultery, uh, he, he really went through deep, deep waters when it, it dawned on him that he would not be allowed to keep the children. Possession. It's a very real cause and source of being scandalized. You had a situation here in this city, uh, uh, what, about nine months ago, not far from this church premises, where a man whose wife had the custody of the children, he had the children for a weekend, and she was make, taking steps to permanently keep him away from the children, and so he killed all three children and himself. That's within a couple of miles of this church building. That's how serious being scandalized can be. Personal relationship, unrequited love. I've met uh, saints uh, in various parts of the world who um, were, were engaged to be married uh, and they were stood up. I, I know, uh, I heard of one just recently where just the day before the wedding, the wedding was cancelled and uh, the girl uh, as, was uh, deeply bruised and, uh, and hurt in a permanent way. You know, <clears throat> it's uh, the tragedy about being scandalized it, it is this, no man's an island. It isn't, you just can't enjoy your own scandalization, your personal scandalization, if there's such a word. Um, 
it affects others, it affects your relatives, it, it affects those who you work alongside. It will have its ramifications week after week, month after month, year after year, until you die if it's not dealt with. It, 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 being scandalized is a permanent sickness. It gets dressed up with outer uh, expressions that are nicer, but when you get close enough, you will hit the real things that lie beneath. Uh, personal opinion is another one. The baptism in the Holy Spirit, the number of people who were scandalized when the charismatic movement erupted. Of course, you've got to go back to the turn of the century to find those who were scandalized with the early Pentecostals. And it's amazing to me how many lies... Um, I mean, I, I have to say, I have yet to see someone swinging from the chandeliers. In fact, I've never been in a church building where there are chandeliers. I mean, there may be. Um, well, I've seen one or two unusual things, but I mean, so did Jesus. The man who was healed at the gate called Beautiful, he's got hold of John on one hand and he's got hold of Peter on the other and he's leaping, which meant either Peter and John were doing it with him or they, I don't know whether they were holding him down or they, they finally got the two on it. Uh, he got the two on it, but he went walking and leaping and praising God with one hand in Peter's hand and one hand in John's hand. That must have been rather unusual in the temple. You know? That must have scandalized quite a few Pharisees. <laughs> David scandalized his wife when she looked out of the window and she saw her husband dancing with all his might unto the Lord. And as a result, she became... Um, What's the word? She wasn't able to have a baby barren for the rest of her life. That's the effects of being scandalized. Shepherding has scandalized a lot of people. And that's tragic. You can think of all sorts of baptism in water. I, I remember one visit here, uh, I made some reference to um, uh, this is this is when it was 70, 73, I think it was, and I was on a visit here, and I made some reference to the the baptismal font being now filled with flowers growing. <laughs> you remember when Pastor Bob changed the baptismal font to grow flowers? I'm sure that must have scandalized no end of people. But I made some little reference to it whilst I was preaching of how wonderful that was. <laughs> And immediately after the meeting, a man who is normal in all other ways, who was visiting this fellowship, he's a minister in this city. He came up to me and he strongly remonstrated with me that I was unloving and I didn't care about the unity of the body of Christ. Well, I want to say to you all here this morning and anywhere else uh, that you can only baptize those that believe. I really believe that with all my heart. And uh, I'm not going to squabble too much about the mode of, of baptism, but I believe the word means what it says, that it, it is John the Dipper, John the Immerser, John the Plunger Underer. <laughs> and uh, the people get scandalized because of that. Do you know, some people have been so scandalized in history, John Kelvin, for whom we have a lot to thank God for, but he was so scandalized about the theology of the Anabaptists who baptized by immersion that he murdered thousands of them. He said, if you want to be baptized, you can be baptized permanently, and he put uh, weights around their waist and they were put under permanently. There was one man, a godly man, who was burned at the stake, and John Kelvin 
uh, ordered that the, the wood that was to be put around that stake would, which was to be green wood. In other words, it would burn slowly. It took four hours for the man to die, and that's a fellow brother in Jesus. Now, I'm serious. This is a born-again man treating another born-again man because he was scandalized. If you're going to hear my spirit this morning, brothers and sisters, there's nothing that will destroy the body of Christ more than being scandalized. Because I, I end with this, but I'll say it now. That is how a root of bitterness comes by which not a few, but many are defiled. Personal advantage. That's where Esau lost his birthright. And, and that was a, a source of him being scandalized. Personal convenience. People who are put out. Uh, they, you, you cross their will. They, they have plans to do something. And you cross their will and that really upsets them. And uh, they, they become... Uh, scandalized as a result of it. Now, of course, you understand none of these things that I'm sharing do you have to be scandalized by. None of them. But these are sources. Uh, personal honor. The prodigal son's brother. Remember, he was outside and he got really upset because here was his brother who'd been a, a no good for, for anything. He'd taken the, his inheritance, he'd squandered it on riotous living, he'd come back to the house, and here was father putting on a feast for this prodigal son where he had been faithful, loyal, serving, and he's outside and his lip is pouting and he's really upset about it all. And he says, you've never killed a calf for me, you've never made a feast for my friends. He's really upset. And the father says, Son, all that I have is yours. But uh, he, he was offended. There's a process of being scandalized. And the first one is disillusionment. Which means you had to have had an illusion to be disillusioned, which is your false expectations. The second one is disenchantment. You're put off. You're no longer impressed. Um, people come here. Uh, it's happened in any charismatic church. It happened before I came here. It, uh, it, it happens anywhere else. Someone comes along to the meetings, they begin to enjoy the fervor, like our brother this morning made reference. He says he senses the presence of Jesus, and people get blessed with him. That's wonderful. They begin to enjoy and clap their hands and maybe even dance a little and praise God. It's good to be here and to enjoy. And then as the weeks and the months go by, see, that's, that's the, the um, not the superficial, but that's what the eye sees and the ear hears and the heart understands of the worship and praise. But the body of Christ is larger than praise and worship. Praise and worship is a very large part of the body of Christ, but the body of Christ is larger than praise and worship. It also has to do with commitment. It also has to do with laying down our lives for one another. It also has to do with loving one another, which is agape, your good at my expense. It's a costly thing to be a member of the body of Christ. And some people don't want to pay the price, and they'll take the best, they enjoy a fellowship here, but when it gets a little close, they move along to another fellowship. Until that becomes a little close, then they move along to another fellowship. Whereas those who dig themselves in and commit themselves and put their roots down, they pay the price, they pay the cost, of being part of that family, and there is a price to be paid. But you know, I've watched people, they come along for so, so long, and it's wonderful, but something happens. Maybe their will was crossed, or something they didn't like was said, 
um, and they become disenchanted, no longer impressed. And then the, 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 the third area, in fact, usually, too, they, they move to, away from the pulpit as the process is going on. Start off here, I always look out for people who used to sit in the front, and I find they're halfway back. And if I find the next time they're two-thirds back, I say, oh, oh, I better get to that person quick, find out what's ticking. <laughs> Usually it's too late, because this process isn't a w done in a week. It takes nine months, it takes a year, sometimes it takes two years. But it is disengagement, they leave. And fourthly, the process is defilement. Disillusionment, disenchantment, disengagement, defilement. Roots of bitterness by which many are defiled. When a person leaves you, whether it's marriage, whether it's business, whether it is house fellowship, church, or whatever, if, the, if these are the reasons, disillusionment, disenchantment, disengagement, because they're being scandalized, uh, they must speak negatively. It is impossible for them to speak positively about you. He who is estranged seeketh an excuse. And usually they will pick on doctrine or they pick on um, uh, the absence of something. You've got to have a reason. And uh, that's human nature. And, and God says it is, that, that it is so. The tragedy is this, beloved, I could start off as an innocent victim and end up defiling many. See, something could, I, I mean, it might be possible that I get up or I meet you at the door, you ask an innocent question and I've got the flu or I'm in a bad mood or something's wrong with me and... Uh, I remember once I was down in the baptistry, that's where you baptize people, in Basingstoke. And uh, they, uh, this, I'd been there about two years, and I'd cut the, we had the baptismal service on the Sunday. This was a Saturday afternoon, and I'd gone down there to make sure they'd filled up the tank. Someone had been given the response, but church secretary's response in those days, which would be our administrator, Dave. And uh, when I got there, nothing had been done. And there was, st we didn't have a proper drain away on our baptistry in Basingstoke, we still don't have. It has to soak away. And from the last baptismal service, there were still two inches of rotten, I mean, what do you, what do you call that water? Stagnant water. I mean, it didn't bless me. <laughs> And I, I was feeling rather sorry for myself. I didn't feel too well. And, uh, and I'm down there with a, a fact I had one of those, those pans that you, you, know, you brush dust in. And I had a, a, it was the only way I could get under the two inches because a bucket wouldn't do it. And so I got, got this large bucket there and I got this dust pan and I was scooping up the water and pouring it into the bucket and then carrying the bucket. Now you may think two inches you can get rid of in next to no time. It's about a two hour job. You know, it's true. And along came one of the brothers, Roy Reefert. Well, I'm sure Ivy will remember Roy. And Roy looked over the top, bless his side. He asked a normal English question. What are you doing? <laughs> And my response was, what does it look like? <laughs> I, I mean, I was coming out here, the, I mean, you could feel the steam rising, you know. <laughs> now, he could have been scandalized. And basically, he would have been an innocent victim of my unkind retort. I mean, the next thing is, he's down there with me, and, and I mean, Roy... Uh, has been a very serving person. And, uh, you know, it's like saying hello to someone. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, it was sort of like him, it was the opening remark. 
and I hit him back verbally. He could have been scandalized. Praise God, he wasn't. He never forgot it. We had a good laugh over the years about that one. But beloved, an innocent victim, if they don't rule that which has happened to them, can become uh, a cause of, of defilement all around them. Let me give you some of the causes of being scandalized. The fall of a leader. The scripture says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Satan knows that if he can get me or get John, or get one of the community leaders, one of the elders, uh, the youth leader, the Sunday school leader, the missionary, if he can just get you to fall and put you down morally or whatever, the sheep will be scattered. I know a church in Liverpool in England some years ago where the pastor fell morally. They had 1,200 people in that church. Within months, they were reduced to 70. And they have never been able to climb back up out of the pit they went down into. I think of a church in St. Louis in the USA that had 1,600 members and the pastor fell morally and within weeks it was reduced to 250 people. I think of a church not far from here in a place called Wenatchee, a very wonderful church where the administrator fell and the leadership were not aware of what was happening and it was a major financial scandal. Some of you, see, you will remember it. That church grew to about 1,500 people. I preached there some months after this happened and there were about 200 people left in that congregation. It's very difficult. I, uh, there are very few fellowships that rise back up after the leadership has fallen morally. Very few. And anyone who's involved in seeking to bring healing and health to such a fellowship has the hardest task to win back credibility and confidence in the people's hearts towards leadership. They, they won't trust. They know better. And uh, they're, basically they are very insecure. Basically they have been scandalized. It occupies their conversation for weeks after week, month after month, year after year. I've gone to fellowships where it happened five years previously and, and they are still talking about what happened. The second area of uh, causes of being scandalized is unfulfilled prophecy. It didn't come to pass. That's happened a lot. People who, who uh, had a word uh, that said a certain thing was going to happen and it didn't happen. That's what brought down Jonah. That's why he wanted to commit suicide or had suicidal thoughts and tendencies. His prophecy hadn't come to pass. Now that was the one giving it. But the one receiving it, like uh, Edna Jones, she was moving towards being scandalized. Someone had prophesied, you're going to have a child, you're going to have a son, and she, it didn't happen. Another one is your rights have been violated. Um... That can be someone who has been falsely charged by the police. Uh, it can be someone 
uh, who uh, had a right to visit their child in a divorce action, and, uh, and those rights are taken away. Lies are told. I shall never forget the first time as a policeman, uh, in all my innocence, I stood up to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, but was shocked to discover the defendant just lied out of the top of his head. And I, I couldn't believe it. What he said I had said and how I had behaved. And uh, I was just an innocent policeman. Now, I tell you, many a policeman becomes uh, defensive and worse than that, moves on to the attack area, will gild the lily. I don't, is that a phrase, Arnold? It's, yes. In the business world, we know those terms. Uh, and uh, you just add a little extra to make it stick. That's what would be said. And, and it's come out of themselves being scandalized. They never thought it was going to be this way, and they find defendants, those they've arrested, telling the most abominable lies about them, and their hearts change, so they begin to make sure it sticks. They become bitter, hurtful men. Rights violated. Being misjudged. Uh, I think probably... The, um, uh, I remember sitting talking with a, a young lady in Basingstoke a number of years ago and uh, she, she'd run away from home for the second time. She was about 17, 16 years of age. And uh, the issue was this, that her, she said her elder sister was the favorite. Her elder sister was a pharisaical um, uh, deceiver. I think that's all I can describe her as. Because I, I knew, I knew she'd put on nice, warm, spiritual language, and everyone was very impressed when she she could even cry when she prayed, and you really felt she was spiritual. She was nothing of the sort. She was a a deceiver, and it must have grieved God. To I, in fact, I'm sure God didn't listen because uh, she could put on a real good show but her parents were very impressed and she became the family favorite the daughter who was much more real the second daughter who was much more real was the one who was regarded as the the black sheep of the family and so on and uh, but the root of it when I talked to this girl right at the heart of it was that she had been punished for something her sister did Something her sister did, and that was that she was scandalized, and so she played the part from there on. So I'm not as good as my sister, so I'll play the part. Her mother automatically knew it was her when it wasn't, and all the other times it happened as the years went by, she would just continue to feed it. She almost took delight or pleasure in some a masochistic manner of, of being accused of something she didn't do because it, 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 it confirmed that she had a right to have this wall that she'd built around herself. She deserved the wall. It was her rights to have that wall. I remember my mum. Uh, I don't know who did it to this day, but I want to tell you it wasn't me. <laughs> I had, I think, about five good spankings in my life, but I had to climb over this one because I did not set the shed alight. <laughs> Somebody did, but I got the spanking for it. And I tell you, that left a deep impression, not only on my... And I want to say that when my mum laid on hands, she really did a good job. She re I remember one time she said, do you want me to stop? And I screamed out, yes. She said, well, I'm not. <laughs> I carried on. I mean, I knew, but I knew she loved me too. But she was convinced that I had set this fire uh, alight in the shed, and I hadn't. But I got the blame for it, and I got spanked for it. Now, I believe God the Spirit is touching things here this morning that you can identify with. 
broken promises. You were promised. Barney said he would phone you back. Or Barney said he would call on you. Or Barney promised he would write you that letter. Uh, or John Chamberlain did. Or, uh, or Billy Graham said it <laughs> on the TV. <laughs> that if you wrote in, he would send you a copy of whatever. And you didn't get it. Now, there are lots of, lots of people, and that becomes deeply embedded, broken promises. Children, some of us here this morning were told we were going to get this, or Dad would take us here. He promised us a fishing trip, or he said he would take me with him for that week into the Okanagan, or, or skiing, or something like that, and there's a promise made. And it was broken. That's where seeds of rejection come in, sown into children's lives and teenage lives, whereby we become scandalized and become bitter. And later on, years after, when we're married, our partner does not understand why we react negatively over certain things and get all upset, because there's still within us the bitterness from the past that is still bearing fruit. Wasn't healed. I think of a man, <clears throat> when I was a policeman in Acton, uh, I knew this person. Uh, we were in a Baptist church and he was in a Pentecostal church and he was a school teacher. And one morning uh, in England, in the schools, at least when I was uh, there five, up to five years ago, you had morning assemblies and you'd sing a hymn. Maybe it was just on Monday morning you would do it, but some schools did it every morning. You'd meet in morning assembly to have master would speak certain instructions or counts or whatever. Those who had won awards or the, the soccer team had beaten the other soccer team and they were mentioned. You got mentioned in dispatches and uh, uh, you'd sing a hymn and there would be a, a quick prayer and off you'd go to classes. And uh, this morning, this particular morning, the reading from the scripture this school teacher read was about blind Bartimaeus. And he said, Jesus hasn't changed. He still heals the blind. Now, he had glasses that were like uh, bottle ends. You know the sort? If you take them off, you can't see much. In fact, you can't see anything at all. Just a blur. And he said that Jesus, he was going to show that Jesus still healed today and healed the blind. He took his glasses off and he stamped on them. This is a true story. David Young was present when it happened, do you remember? He took his glasses off and he crushed them on the stage and waited to be healed. But he wasn't healed. He married uh, the pastor's daughter and they both ended up in a backslidden state. And the last I heard, they were still backslidden. And I tell you, that man, when I knew him, was absolutely sold out to God. False expectations. I remember Cameron McAlpine saying, uh, one of the lessons he, he learned early on in his ministry, he was sitting on a platform, and there was a little voice said to him, See that woman in the third row go and, uh, who was blind? The uh, little voice said, go and lay hands on her. She's going to be healed. But the, that little word wasn't confirmed in his spirit. Let the peace of God umpire in your heart. Let the peace of God make the decision, yes or no. And he just stopped himself in time because... Cameron McAlpine has always been, to my knowledge, a man who loves the Lord with all his heart. He's probably the holiest man I've ever met. He is 100% sold out to Jesus Christ. But he was able to detect. There, the pressure on him was to be obedient because he desire any man who's sold out to Jesus wants to be obedient. And so the pressure was to, to do it. And he just held himself. He checked it out. 
I've heard those voices that say go and do something but it's not God that man became scandalized finances God didn't provide and uh, lastly the offense of another I don't know, I'm sure there's scripture for it, but I've been impressed with this, that there is no grace for those who carry the offense of another. Where you are personally involved, say Rob and I had a, a bit of a tis was. We, we, uh, we um, whatever you like, you know, we had a verbal fight and uh, he really was very unkind. You know, he said oh, a lot of our unkind things and said I was boastful and uh, swanked off good suits and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, where he was happy to be with his pullover and, and that in the meetings and that. And, uh, and made a <laughs> real big impression. And I go home and I said, you know, darling, that Rob Beck, uh, uh, not Rob Beck, Rob Lydell. Uh, sorry, Rob Beck. <laughs> God bless you. Uh, that Rob, he really gave me a mouthful today uh, and, and sort of let off steam a bit. And, and then I see Rob the next day and, uh, and he says, Barney, I'm really sorry that, that I spoke to you. Uh, I, I just lost my wallet and uh, had $300 in it and I was really feeling bad about that and I saw you with your best suit on. It just didn't bless me and I'm, I really want to apologize <laughs> for that and so on. <clears throat> and and he goes on and I say, oh Rob, bless your heart, that's uh, that's all right. And we go off, we're back in love again together, brothers, the bond of love binding our hearts. It's wonderful. There's grace for it. But my wife still carries on. She will remember what he said about me. She'll remember it a year t year's time. That Rob, Lyle, and what he said. Look at him there, hypocrite. <laughs> Stuff like that. There is no grace. And brethren and sisters, beware of carrying the offense of another. Beware of it. There's no grace for it. To get out of it. Lastly, how do we get out or avoid being scandalized? Jesus said... <clears throat> that uh, we're to treat it seriously. And he put it this way, radically. He said, if your hand scandalizes you, or if your eye, uh, cut it off, if your eye scandalizes you, pluck it out. Now, Jesus wasn't meaning literally pull out your eye. It's not very nice, is it, David and Stephen? Pull out your eye. I mean, it's pretty, but he didn't mean that. See, but he was metaphorically, he was, you may not understand that word, but it, 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 uh, it, it was a picture uh, describing earnestly what he was trying to say. He, what Jesus was saying is, treat this very, very seriously. Nothing, no action is too radical to deal with it. And just if your eye offended, offended you, pluck it out. If your hand offended you, cut it off. I mean, that everyone needs, needs eyes to see and hands to work. You know, it's your life that is at stake. Beware. Deal radically with it. Treat it seriously. Secondly, accept the sovereignty of God. Edna Jones had to come to a place where she accepted God is sovereign. The scripture does say God repented that he'd made man, or God did repent, which, which simply means the, word, the Greek word is metanoin. It means to change your mind. God changed his mind. Let God be sovereign. God knows the end from the beginning, and he sees it all. Put together. We only see in part. God says, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. And we need to know that. We need to acknowledge that. We do not see the whole picture. We only see in part. God is sovereign. I remember when, when Howard and Carol lost their second child, I remember driving back 
from Maidstone in Kent where I had taken them to spend a week. And I remember driving along the road, banging my fist upon the driving wheel, saying, God, why? Tears running down my face, feeling the pain and hurt as their spiritual pastor. And, and, and really distraught. And I, I really, I was angry. I was hurting. And I tell you something, I don't believe God was offended either. And I want to say something, I have never felt that I should apologize for doing what I did. And I still haven't. I'm not proud of that. I just believe God knew my heart. And he received what I, my, my expression of, of pain and hurt at that time. Now God answered that prayer within months. God answered that prayer with so many people who came to Jesus Christ through Howard and Carol and their testimony on that housing estate where they live at Winkleberry uh, in Basingstoke. Very, very important. Accept the sovereignty of God. Thirdly, resist self-pity as you would resist cancer. Resist self-pity as you would resist cancer. That's an awful thing, self-pity. And we all get attacked with it. It, it, it. You bet your life, every one of us here, a child will have it if you get spanked and, and uh, you, you, you don't remember the cause, uh, the offense that you gave to get spanked. All you remember is uh, that it hurt and I'm not loved. And uh, Remember Ron McLean spoke about, uh, you know, how he... Uh, conjured up thoughts in his mind of his own funeral and his mum. I remember once when I was a little boy, um, I got sent to my bedroom. And in England, we, in our house, we had no central heating. And I deliberately went into the other bedroom where it was much colder in the, in the front bedroom because it caught the east wind. And there I was, uh, I took, took my vest off, and there I am just in my little whatever you put on lower around down below and I'm standing there and I'm I'm wanting to catch pneumonia <laughs> that's the truth and I was very upset that I never did catch pneumonia didn't even catch a cold I just felt cold <laughs> don't allow self-pity you can picture me there can't you shivering <laughs> I, I was there for about two hours looking forward to this pneumonia. <laughs> receive, fourthly, receive firm counsel. I remember, uh, yeah, I've mentioned it before, but I mention it again because it's worth it. It's, it's, it's a milestone in my life when Zach Poonan, a lovely, godly Indian Bible teacher, visited our home, I just was experiencing some very painful and unjust action by some brothers in England. And uh, he, he made the mistake of our, uh, he'd gone up to his bedroom and he was unpacking his case and I was sitting on the bed uh, making him feel at home. And uh, he made the mistake of asking me, how are you? And seeking to walk in the light, I told him. And I went through the whole story of what was, I didn't mention any names, I was very careful not to, but I told him what I was suffering. And when I'd finished, he said, so what? <laughs> and I laughed. I said, yeah, so what? <laughs> it's just what I needed. I didn't need someone to say, oh, brother, I really empathize with you. Now, you need to know when to say, so what? <laughs> those of you who would like to handle hand that out but but at the same time don't be afraid embrace do you know it's an honor Proverbs says it is an honor for someone to speak straight to you and who doesn't have to butter it all up and put marzipan around it and fancy paper and candles on the top you know really touch your soulish senses first of all before they stick the knife in <laughs> It's an honor not to be anesthetized before you get the knife. That's what it says. 
Do you know we ought to embrace men and women who tell you as it is and really receive them as precious jewels. So often they are not received and, and that's tragic. Uh, I, 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 or I admire people who shoot it to me straight. I may not enjoy it, and it may take several hours for me to recover. But I always ask them, give me 24 hours. And, I, and uh, it gives me time to think it through, and the next day I'll come back and thank you. Because it's, it's good, it's healthy. Uh, receive firm counsel. Naaman did from his servant. Uh, love God's law. Psalm 119, verse 165. Those who love thy law have great peace, no matter what happens, and nothing causes them to be scandalized. Nothing causes them to stumble. Uh, <clears throat> sixthly, never presume. James 4 and 15 uh, says this, uh, don't say tomorrow I'm going to do this and tomorrow I'm going to do that because that produces false expectations. But say, if the Lord wills, or as the brethren used to say, DV. In fact, we always used to announce the evening preacher, brother so-and-so from Ramsgate will preach at our uh, evening gospel meeting, DV. And sometimes it was good they put DV because the car broke down or the bicycle got punctured or so they never did arrive. Uh, and, and we're encouraged to, by the Spirit of God through James to never presume exactly how it will be. I think of a, a lovely couple who, uh, they weren't believers, but they were a lovely couple. They, they were good husband and wife and they saved up for their retirement. And uh, one year before he was due to retire, he died with cancer. And they had spent 45 years putting their money together, saving up for this retirement. He never retired. And she was a woman that you'd ever meet. You know, David said in Psalm 119, Deliver thou thy servant from presumptuous sins. Don't let them have dominion over me. That's what presumption does. It begins, it'll rule you if it doesn't happen. And finally, uh, 1 John chapter 2. And verse 10. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause stumbling in him there's no cause for him being scandalized or causing others to be scandalized unnecessarily love your brother agape when you and I are so busy laying down our lives giving out serving loving Jesus giving out love and praise and worship to him loving our brother, giving out encouragement and blessing and edifying him, there'll be no place. It's impossible to say loving words and think unkind thoughts or say unkind things. It really is. You, you, I don't say don't try it, but you'll find that. You can't do the two things at the same time. James says that. And it's true. Let's just bow in prayer. Father, one of the main reasons why we get scandalized is, is because we think we've been wrestling with flesh and blood. And so often, Father, we, we think uh, that the problem has been of a human agency and we regard men after the flesh and not after the spirit. 
Father, I pray that Jesus may become so preeminent in our lives, in my life, Lord, that I may so hide your word in my heart, that I may meditate upon it day and night, that I might be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in due season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he doeth it shall prosper. Father, when we are filled with you, when we are filled with love, your love in our hearts overflowing, when Jesus is Lord and King in our lives, when we are drawing our life from him, we are, when we are loving our brothers and sisters as ourselves, there is no room for us to be scandalized. Father, some of us here this morning have been scandalized. And I ask you, Lord God, that you will give them grace and courage to take whatever action is necessary to deal with that, to make that phone call, to write that letter, to pay that visit, to take that journey by plane, whatever it is, Lord, that will deal with that being scandalized. Father, will you put determination in their hearts? Your word says that you work in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Will you work in such a one, both to will and to do that which is necessary for the fountain within to be clean and clear, for their lives to radiate the glory and presence of Jesus, that instead of people being defiled, people may be sanctified, People may be encouraged and drawn to the Savior. Father, touch our lives and cause our lives to be lived to the praise of your glory. Father, even now, let there be a swift response to the word of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. hope you have enjoyed this message and that it has enriched your life. If you would like to see our entire list of life-building messages by various Holy Spirit-inspired speakers, go to the Video Sermon tab on our Free Bible Study Lessons website. That is www.freebiblestudylessons.com. May God richly bless you as you study His Word.